I'll, I'll now invite uh, Lord Moncton to make his opening remarks. Lord Moncton, please. My Lords, that's me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the climate, like the cricket, is chaotic. Who would have believed that England would not only win back the Ashes, but would then hang on to them the next time round? Just thought I'd rub it in. <laughs> now, because the climate is chaotic, or even if it isn't, it acts as though it were, it is not predictable in the long term. And that if you do science by consensus, and that was the central argument that Professor Dennis offered us today, that there is a consensus. If you do claim it by consensus, then the consensus is expressed in the documents of IPICAC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they say that the climate is a coupled, non-linear, chaotic object, and that therefore the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. The Royal Society, in a complete rewrite of its original disastrously unscientific statement about the climate, now says, we do not know how much the planet will warm as a result of our activities. And the idea that you decide any scientific question by mere consensus is opposed by the philosophers of science from Aristotle 2,400 years ago to Al-Haytham, the founder of the scientific method in 11th century Iraq, to uh, Karl Popper in 1934 in the celebrated paper that formalised the scientific method as an iterative algorithm. In none of these people's opinion is science, or was it, or will it ever be, decided by consensus. As Einstein himself said when replying to a book by the Nazis who regarded his science as Jewish science and they wished to attack it and they had a hundred scientists against Einstein, he said, if there is something wrong with my theory, one paper will be enough to set the entire theory aside. You won't need a hundred scientists. So merely counting heads, the argumentum ad populum, Merely saying that various scientific societies are uh, august, the argumentum ad vericundiam, the arguments from headcount fallacy and reputation fallacy, respectively, are not proper scientific arguments. The sort of questions that you might have asked and perhaps should ask in a free country are these. You might have asked, I wonder why the usual suspects cry consensus when it is so clear in the history of science that consensus is not the way science is done. Why does official climate science still pretend the Middle Ages were not warmer than the present when the fabricators of the 2001 UN report's purported abolition of the medieval warm period are now under criminal investigation for defrauding taxpayers by tampering with data and results? I wonder why the published version of the 1995 UN report, written by just one man, stated the exact opposite of the scientists' final draft, which had said five times that no human influence on global temperature was either discernible or immediately foreseeable. Or I wonder why the published version of the 2007 UN report deploys a flagrantly fraudulent statistical technique to pretend that the world is warming ever faster and that we are to blame. And why do we think that we're going to suddenly get 3.3 Celsius for a doubling of CO2 concentration this century, that's the IPCC's central estimate, or 5.1, which is your government's central estimate, when all the science done by measurement and observation rather than by models suggests just one Celsius degree? And then uh, Professor Dennis raised the question of the insurance principle just in case there might be a risk of a large asteroid hitting us. We should spend 150% of global GDP from now forever to try to make sure we have a large cricket bat to <laughs> knock them out of the way again. <laughs> and in the London insurance market, we have a saying, and that is 
that if the cost of the premium exceeds the cost of the risk, don't insure. And that brings me to the carbon tax and the mineral resources rent tax. Now, both of these taxes are going to cost more than the cost of letting global warming happen, happen in the first place. One question we should ask is, how much global warming will a 5% reduction in Australia's emissions, which represent in turn 1.2% of global emissions, actually achieve? Well, here's the numbers. 0.06% of world carbon emissions remitted over the next 10 years, and the amount of carbon dioxide that would have been in the atmosphere, according to the IPCC, would fall from, wait for it, 412 to 411.987. Parts per million. And this would forestall, wait for it again, 0.0007 Celsius degrees of global warming. This is consensus mainstream calculation. And this is one fourteen thousandth of a Celsius degree. It is one seven hundredth of the threshold below which no modern method or instrument can detect any change in global temperature at all. And how much will it cost? Around 127 billion over the next 10 years. And if you were to, to apply the Gillard method all over the world, a method as cost ineffective as her proposals, then it would take $60,000 per head of the world population just in the next 10 years, or 60% of global GDP, just to forestall the 0.23 Celsius of global warming that the IPCC predicts will occur over the next 10 years. And it is clearly cheaper to do nothing about global warming and to adapt in a focused way to any consequences that are adverse that may occur from any warming that may occur than to spend any money whatsoever now on it. And that, if you do science by consensus, as Professor Dennis does, is the overwhelming consensus in the peer-reviewed economic literature. And it's the peer-reviewed literature that you find the true science in. And reviews of that literature by Lomborg in 2007 and Richard Toll in 2009 make it abundantly clear that the majority, in fact, a near unanimity among economists show that it is greatly more expensive to try to intervene and to try, canute-like, to tamper with the climate than simply to sit back, enjoy the sun sunshine and adapt in a focused way as and if and only when necessary. And therefore, the carbon tax is the wrong solution to a non-problem. It has no place in the future of Australia. And what I should have liked to hear from the press of Australia is those pressmen speaking up for the heroes of labour, the mine workers, who are menaced with the destruction of their jobs, the men who dig the darkness underground to bring us light. These great men, a dozen of whom joined me in the Hunter Valley on the platform when I spoke there last week and received a standing ovation from their terrified community, they want you, gentlemen of the press and ladies of the press, to speak for them. The coal workers, menaced by Prime Minister Brown with a destruction of their industry, and we, too, once had a Prime Minister called Brown, and we learned not to do that. So please, speak up for your working people. The tie that I wear today, and I proudly wear today, is the tie of the Democratic Labour Party, Senator John Madigan's party. I had the privilege of spending yesterday with this great man. And here is a man who speaks for Labour, who speaks for the people who are going to be disadvantaged by this tax. These are the people who need your help, not merely critically to, uh, uncritically to accept consensus, but instead to ask the questions about the fraudulent science, which is in each of the conclusions of the three major IPCC reports. Ask questions about why it is that global warming is happening at the moment and has been happening over the last 60 years at only one-fifth of the rate now predicted by your government. Ask the question how, in science, there could be any chance that the rate of just 
roughly one Celsius per century of warming that has been occurring can suddenly become roughly five Celsius per century, as it were, overnight. There is no physical basis in science for any such sudden lurch in what has proven to be an immensely stable climate. And the people of Australia are frightened. They are frightened of their government. They are frightened of you. The world is also frightened. Australia is now regarded as a sovereign risk. Please, I beg you, do not merely accept consensus. Think and think again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now turn to, we now turn to questions from uh, our journalists in the audience. The first question today is from Christian Kerr. Christian Kerr from The Australian. A question to both our participants. Gentlemen, neither of you, as you have said, are scientists. Both of you have worked for very different politicians of very different philosophies. Today, aren't you just engaging in that old battle between laissez-faire and the central planners and the centrally controlled economy? Lord Monkton. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, fascinating question, uh, Christian. Uh, and indeed, you could say that uh, I am, by inclination, a non-interventionist. However, let it be very clear, if anyone convinces me that the science points to an alarming and dangerous rate of global warming, then I will change my tune and I will say that perhaps we should try to do something about it, provided that it is cheaper to do something about it than to take the consequences of not doing something about it. One has to ask two questions here. One, is it going to warm at anything like the predicted rate? That is the only scientific question that really needs to be answered. And I have studied and indeed lectured at faculty level in the determination of climate sensitivity. I have written papers in the reviewed literature on the subject. So I do have some knowledge of it as a reasonably competent mathematician who has profited enormously by the use of mathematics over the years. The eternity puzzle that I launched here in Australia 12 years ago became puzzle of the year in Australia. I'm glad you all enjoyed it so much. But the, the central point here is that that's the first question, how much warming are we going to get? It is now blindingly obvious, if you look at the data and the evidence, that the rate of warming simply isn't enough to be sufficient. And even if it were enough to be sufficient, it is blindingly obvious that it is far, far cheaper. And this is the important point, far cheaper. In fact, something like 30 or 40 times cheaper to do nothing about it now than to try to forestall it by the vastly expensive methods that your government currently proposes. Thank you. Um.